So yeah, to introduce ourselves, as Max sort of has already highlighted, we're developer advocates from IBM based in the UK, and we love all things cloud native and Java. So sort of the perfect place to be right now with other people who love cloud native and Java. So we're going to talk about 15 must have factors that you need to be building really effective cloud native applications that don't just survive on the cloud, but really thrive within that cloud environment. So why do we care about this area? Next slide, please, Jamie. Well, it's all about the cloud. If anyone's seen Toy Story, you'll get this reference. Ooh, the cloud. We're really excited about the cloud, uh, especially within development, because it offers us so many advantages and capabilities and improvements upon sort of what we were developing before. It offers things like flexibility, cost savings, uh, because you're, you're sort of utilizing that at scale um, and utilizing things like um, high availability, et cetera. So loads of different benefits. So we want to be building applications that really take advantage of this underlying infrastructure as much as possible. And to do that, we can look towards various different methodologies. Next slide, please. So you guys might have come across something called the 12 factor app methodology. Next slide, please. This is a methodology that, methodology that was created by the guys over at Heroku, and it's sort of been adopted uh, by a wide variety within the industry as this sort of rule book, I guess, or, or guidelines of how to create cloud native applications. And this original 12 factors, when they were originally created, which was a, a few decades back, it was a fantastic start for us in terms of looking at the various aspects of developer, development of an application and looking at, okay, how can I make this ready for the cloud? But as technologies have progressed and evolved, these factors had to be evolved too. And so the 12 factor application then became the 15 factor app methodology. So in this methodology, you might see that some of those original factors, which you might've come across before, um, are either the same or very similar. So for example, we've got things like one code base, one application. Well, in the original 12 factors that were just called code base. The only thing here is we've just really brought out that key part of this factor that you have to have a one-to-one -one relationship between your application and your code base and a one-to-many relationship between your code base and your deploy. So it's really pulling out that one-to-one -one relationship between code base and application. So that's had a slight revision, but it's mostly the same. The ones that have actually changed are the ones that we're highlighting here in yellow. So we've got API first, telemetry, and authentication and authorization. A lot of the others are very similar to that original 12 factors, just with slight tweaks and revisions. Uh, so for example, in number four here, you can see that instead of build release run, which was the original 12 factors, um, it's now design build release run. So pulling in that design aspect, because we now know we are developing in an agile manner. So instead of having one huge design that gets followed through in a waterfall uh, sort of style fashion, we now know we have to be incorporating elements of design into every single stage of application development. And so this has been added into that factor. Things like environmental parity. In the original factors, that was just dev prod parity. But we have more environments than just development and production. So it's actually about keeping all of our environments as similar as possible. QA, testing, development, production, whatever it may be. So we've made that a broader factor here and sort of incorporating environments that might not have been incorporated before. So you can see how these have sort of been iterated upon. But the ones we're gonna focus on within this presentation, just because of time restraints, are those three new factors. So we're gonna deep dive into them, what they mean, why they were added, and how we can potentially go about adding them into our own applications through the use of open source technologies. So in order to do this, we're gonna utilize a hands-on interactive lab. And this hands-on lab, you can do yourself if you'd like to, or you can just watch us for the time being. We utilize a browser-based sandbox environment. So if you do wanna do this at home, all you'll need is a browser, which I imagine most of you guys have, um, and you can just head to a link that we'll share um, in a minute. I'll try and add it to the chat somehow, or we'll share it on the slides. And essentially what that allows you to do is try out all of these different technologies without needing any local prerequisites on your own machine. So it can enable you to try out these technologies in a fun and engaging way 
without needing to worry about sort of the prerequisites and all that boring process. So the actual lab that we use, uh, the actual application within those labs, we try and keep that the same just to make it easy for you two guys to follow along with the different labs. So for example, if I was interested in looking at how I can introduce logging or how I can introduce metrics, for example, into my application, those are two different labs, but actually we use the same application. So instead of having to look at what each application is doing in each lab and understand that, we've made it easy by making them all the same. So you can just focus on the new technology. It's made up of two different microservices. We've kept it really simple so that, again, you don't have to worry about the code of the application itself, just that new technology that you're learning. So the two microservices are system and inventory. Essentially, the system service just returns the system property information for your host. Um, and the inventory service tracks the number of systems that you have, and then it can invoke the system service to then retrieve that information. And you can use a REST endpoint to be able to access that information. So the latest uh, system property information is stored there. So that's the application we're going to be using today. And these are all based off our Open Liberty guides. If you've not come across Open Liberty before, that's our cloud native open source runtime. Um, and it's one, going to be one of the open source tools we're utilizing today in our labs. Now we have loads of guides. So if you are interested in any of the factors we're not covering today, I've got some links at the end of this presentation that take you to an article that basically lists out all the guides you should try for each of those factors. So depending on which one you're interested in, go and check out that guide. You can run it in our cloud environment as well. So you can check those out as well. So let's take a look at those additional three factors that I was talking about and why they were added to this 12 factor application methodology. The first of those is API first. So the important part to consider here is that not all of these factors directly relate into a specific technology that has to be used, for example. Some of them are more about methodologies and processes, uh, but they can also utilize technology as well. So in this case, we've got API first, which is really all about giving teams the ability to work against each other uh, through the use of things like public contracts. And that means that they don't have to have any interference in the internal development process within those microservices. So API first is all about sort of thinking about what you're building as an API that's then going to be consumed by client applications and services. So it's how are you presenting your microservice to others, other services that need to use it or other applications? And so this is a really important factor to include because it helps to avoid things like integration failures and it helps to formally recognize your APIs as a first class sort of artifact in your development process. So this is a really interesting one to take a look at today. And actually you can utilize open source tools to be able to do this. So one that we're going to be taking a look at today is OpenAPI. Um, you can also utilize tools like API Blueprint, um, or you can use proprietary products if you'd like to, like Apiary or IBM's API Connect tools. We're going to be taking a look at OpenAPI Connect today. Um, sorry, OpenAPI, and that's the technology we're going to be taking a look at. It is open source, um, and you can access that through MicroProfile. If you've not come across MicroProfile before, it is a fantastic open source collaborative um, sort of specification that really is community driven, huge community of developers within organizations and independently who contribute to it. And it's really a way to enable Java or Jakarta e based applications um, to be microservice ready. So providing important APIs uh, for you to be able to develop microservices for the cloud on Java EE and Jakarta EE. So that's what we're going to be utilizing today. Um, and then the next factor, so that's the first lab we're going to do, but I'm just going to take you through each of the factors first, and then we'll move on to the labs just quickly. So the next one is telemetry. Now, for those of you who are keen eyed, you might have noticed that we already have a factor for logs. So why did we need to add in this additional factor on telemetry? Well, actually, although logs offer us sort of, they offer the ability to be able to test when it's sort of in that development on your local machine. Uh, they can give us really interesting sort of feedback into how our application is behaving. But when we deploy that application into the real world, that's when we want to be using telemetry. We want to be accessing things like health and metrics data to understand how our application is behaving in reality, not just locally on our own local machines. And so this is why it's important to differentiate between those two different factors 
and should introduce telemetry because often we're deploying to distributed remote environments now across the cloud. So it's really important that we still keep this insight into how our application is behaving and whether it's healthy. So this factor is all about, as I said, enabling you to have insight into your application and how it's doing. And that's really important because nowadays our applications are a lot more complex than they might have been, say, a decade ago. So it's really important that considering our applications can often be composed of hundreds, if not thousands of microservices that are really highly dynamic and distributed at scale, it's really important that we are able to monitor those successfully and understand that our application is working in the way that we intended. So how can we go about achieving this factor? Well, we can utilize things like, uh, again, MicroProfile can help with this. We have two APIs within MicroProfile we could utilize, MicroProfile Metrics and MicroProfile Health. So these can provide really interesting information on how your application is doing. Are your microservices up and healthy uh, and metrics, important metrics that you can pull back from them? You can also, also utilize tools like Grafana, uh, for example, to create dashboards to easily view any metrics that you're pulling from your application to, again, get that quick snapshot of how is my application doing? Is it healthy and behaving as it should be? So again, we're going to hopefully, if we have time, take a look at another lab that will take us through uh, one of these AP APIs as well to show you how you can integrate that into your own applications. And then the final one that was added is authentication and authorization. Now, interestingly, when you take a look back at the 12 factor app methodology, there was no mention of security. That's a huge issue. Log4j has shown us that security is really important within our applications. And so this was added to be able to add in that sort of behavioral thought, as well as the technology of we have to be securing our applications. And so this is broken down into authentication and authorization. So basically, do you know if a user is authorized to be able to access it? And do you know who that user is through authentication? So this is just about adding that additional security step. Why? Well, it enables increased security, and that's important, especially in a distributed nature of cloud applications. Um, and we can, we can enable this through the use of things like securing endpoints. So we can use things like RBAC, role-based access control, or we can use tools like OpenID Connect, OAuth, um, KeyCloak, IBM App ID. There's tons out there. We can also make use of another microprofile specification if we want, called JWT, uh, JSON Web Tokens, which allows us to create that uh, security again for our endpoints. So that's a super quick run through of the three additional factors that we have. And we're gonna deep dive into how we can enable two of those just due to time constraints um, in our own applications through our hands-on labs. So I'm gonna pass over to Jamie now for those hands-on demos. Awesome, brilliant. Can you hear me okay, Grace? Yeah, can hear you, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Okay, um, in the essence of time, as realistically we only have 10 minutes, um, I'm going to go through just one of these. Um, so we do have documentation and guides on pretty much all of these. So if you go to the Open Liberty website and uh, go to for slash guides, there's loads of different guides here that talk about these different things. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, how we can add health to Kubernetes. So taking advantage of things like the liveliness probe, the readiness probe, um, things like that to make sure our microservices um, are doing what they should. We're getting the data telemetry data back and we're actually doing something with it. Um, so you can just head over to this link. Grace will prov hopefully it'll be provided in the chat. Um, there will be a little button up here, which is running cloud. Now you can run this locally if you want, um, but you'll have to install the prereqs. And because we're using Kubernetes, you will need Docker in Kubernetes. Um, so the safe bet is to just run it in the cloud because then we don't have to worry about prereqs and it's all done in this um, cloud environment. So it shouldn't take long to spin up. Um, essentially, this is a cloud native environment. So it's built with these kind of um, factors in mind. So for example, being able to scale, um, having the right security, as you can see, we have a little robot thing here. Um, so basically what's happening is as I'm launching this environment, it's spinning, spinning up a container which is running on the IBM clouds, which is running in OpenShift, which is a container orchestrator, um, which basically has everything I need in it. So it has my IDE, which you'll see here on the right. Um, it has Maven, it has Java, um, it has Docker, it has access to a Kubernetes cluster. So really you kind of get everything um, all there in one go. Okay, so I'm gonna try and make this as big as possible just so everyone can see it correctly. Um, don't worry too much about the instructions on the left-hand side. Like I said, you can do this yourself, but I'm just going to explain what I'm doing as I'm going along. 
Okay, so if you are following along, just a quick explanation. It's an IDE here, just like um, VS Code. If you want to open a new terminal, you can just do it like that. And all your um, files, etc., will come up under the projects view. So what we're going to learn today, well, we're going to learn how to create health check endpoints for your microservices, and then we're going to configure Kubernetes to use those endpoints to make sure our applications and our microservices are running smoothly. So MicroProfile Health allows for services to report their health, and it also publishes the overall health status of defined endpoints. So if a server reports up, then, it, then it's available, and if a server reports down, then we know it's unavailable. Um, and again, so it basically it it, uh, it basically reports an individual service status at an endpoint and indicates that overall status as up if all the services are up, and the service orchestrator can then use the health statuses to make decisions based on the, that data. Okay, um, so Kubernetes, if you're not familiar with it, it provides liveliness, readiness. Uh, and startup probes, and they all do different things. So these probes essentially check certain files uh, in your container. It can check TCP sockets. Um, it can make HTTP requests. And it can also check that our resources aren't consuming, uh, microservices aren't consuming too many resources, because if they are, then we shouldn't be sending requests and things like that to our services if they can't cope with anymore. Okay, so let's just get started. Um, first thing you need to do is make sure you're in this directory, which you should be. Um, and then we're going to clone down um, a Git repository. And this will have kind of the, the application we need to, that we need to launch onto Kubernetes. So with Kubernetes, generally you have to, um, you have a local uh, where you build your application. So this would be my local Docker engine, which is technically running inside this container. Um, but you, our Kubernetes cluster isn't inside the container. So when you're moving something from uh, locally, so your local Docker registry to um, a Kubernetes cluster that's remote, you first have to put it into a registry. So what you can do is you can put it into a Docker registry, um, you can use Artifactory, or you can use a custom one. Today, we're just going to use the IBM registry just for ease of use, and it's all set up here, so you don't have to have accounts and log in. All that stuff kind of comes with um, this environment. So essentially, all we're going to do is basically get the namespace of our container registry. I'm just going to add it to this, um, this variable here just so we can use it easily. Just going to make sure the right namespace is copied yep and then basically i'm just going to run this command which will log into the registry for me and again the registry is really just there as a place to store it um, for this the purpose of this demo while we then launch it onto kubernetes okay so it looks like we're all logged into the registry perfect um, again all our app files are here uh, there's two directories there's a start and a finish the finish is the complete application uh, basically what we're trying to achieve and the start de directory is what we're going to start with today Hey Jamie, okay, you able so to zoom in a little on the right. I can try. Um, yeah, that's better. Hopefully, yeah. that's a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah perfect. All right. We'll see how easy it is to uh, do this with it so zoomed in. Okay. So you, again, you can copy the commands from the instructions if you're using those straight into the terminal just for ease of use. Um, the touch commands essentially just create files. So just so we don't have to do it via the IDE. Once you create your file, you'll notice a little green dot here, which means a new file has been created and those changes are basically unsaved or unsaved to a repository. So I'm just going to go down here and open that file. So it's a blank file. Um, and for ease of use, I'm just going to copy in all the application code. Um, I'm going to have to zoom out a tiny bit because the scroll is starting to go crazy. Okay, so application, this is the application code. I'll try and zoom in a bit here. Um, so basically, we're saying that this probe is on startup. So this is we're going to reference this with the Kubernetes startup probe. And what are we doing here? We're basically checking CPU usage. So if CPU usage is higher than 95% uh, essentially, we're going to De Kubernetes should deem this microservice unhealthy and we shouldn't be sending um, requests to it. So that's pretty much what this is doing here. Um, we're basically just creating our startup check and it's essentially just verifying um, that, yeah, verifying that our application, the CPU usage is below 95% because we don't want to be sending requests from our clients to a microservice where the CPU usage is over 95% because they're probably not going to get served correctly. 
Um, ignoring the red things, they're just coming from the environment. Don't worry about those. They don't affect um, the building of your application one bit. OK, so copy in the inventory liveliness check. So very similar here again. As you can see, we have a different annotation. So we're using the at liveliness annotation. Um, and what are we doing here? We're basically checking that our memory usage now is below 90%. So if we're using 90%, we don't want containers generally, you define how much memory is in a container. And we want to make sure we're not consuming all the resources in that container. Otherwise, everything's going to start to go slow. So the liveliness check here basically just checks that um, we're not consuming more than 90% of our memory uh, allocated memory resources. OK, so we've now just implemented two checks. Um, let's go to the third one uh, again. Use the touch command. To create your file, it will appear here as another little U. And then I'm just going to copy the code in and I'll explain what the code does. I'm on time. Okay, it should be okay. All right, so we have our application code. So this one is for the readiness check. Now, what this is, what is this doing? So this is actually going to test against our endpoints, and this is going to actually test that it will receive something back from our endpoint. So it's okay that you know our container is using less than 95% CPU. It's okay that it's using less than 90% memory usage. Great. Both of those checks have passed, but the final check, if I can't hit any of the endpoints, well, it, it's still not usable. So that's essentially what this last check does. Um, it just checks that it can hit an endpoint, and if it can, it's going to come back with that it's up. And if it can't um, hit that endpoint and doesn't get the response back it requires, it will then register as down. OK, so we basically um, added um, checks into our microservices. I'm just going to zoom out so I can create this. Um, so now what we need to do is we need a YAML file. Um, the YAML file for Kubernetes basically allows you to, um, it should appear down here. Uh, this is basically conf the configuration you require for deploying something. And this is where we're going to specify our checks. So let me just make this bigger. I'll zoom in a little bit again. Um, so we've got three checks for each. We're doing two microservices, like Grace said. There's an inventory and a system. Um, the system just returns JVM properties from the host, and the inventory basically records those um, and then can call the system when it needs to. So as you can see here, we've got a health check, um, the startup probe, which is going to check that path. We have the same with the liveliness probe, which is going to check this path. And of course, you can set things like um, the delay seconds, timeout seconds, because there's no point in these probes um, starting to check our microservices within a second, because we know for a fact that sometimes our microservices might take 10 seconds. So it's better to do the initial delay, which delays that a little bit, so then they can start checking. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the main things you need to take from um, the Kubernetes YAML file. When you're doing this, if you are following me along, do remember to save each of these files. I'm just pressing Control C on my keyboard. Um, it might be slightly different to you, but um, of course, if we don't save these files, nothing's going to work. So do remember to do that. All right. OK, so next thing, last thing. Now we've got our application. And it should all be done. Um, now I'm just going to package that application up. Um, it helps if I'm in the right directory. So I'll go into the start directory and we'll try and package that up again. Uh, remember, the finished directory is the completed stuff. So basically, it's the changes we've already done here. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run this. Um, you should all have a similar experience because, again, this is running on the cloud, so it should have relatively fast internet connection. Um, the first time you do a Maven build, it's going to take a while because it has to download all the dependencies. But as you can see, um, if I run it again, it will complete very quickly because it doesn't have to download all the dependencies again. OK, so now we've got that. Um, I'm just going to pull down the latest. Well, I'm going to pull down an Open Liberty Docker image from Docker Hub to make sure what I've got locally is the latest. Um, and then essentially what we're going to do, we're going to do Docker builds. So that will entail essentially um, selecting the right image. So from the image I'm pulling down now, if you don't have it pulled down locally, I'll just use a local one. Uh, if you don't have it locally, I'll just use one from Docker Hub. The next one, we're going to label the image. Then we're going to copy in the Open Liberty configuration. Then we're going to copy in the application. And then finally, you'll see it's going to run a configure.sh script at the end. That is essentially going in to the container. And at build time, it's updating all the packages inside there. So like Grace mentioned, security is very important. And it's something we kind of think about after we've done our application. So having this kind of script inside our um, inside our con in that is used at build time will help hopefully alleviate some of the vulnerabilities you might get in the actual underlying Docker images um, and the Docker container.
So we just give that a moment. Um, then finally, while this is doing this, I'm just going to carry on explaining stuff as we go along, just so you're not waiting. Um, this is basically going to just tag um, our images with the namespace of our container registry. So the step you did right at the start of this. Um, let me just get this. Going. The configure sh script can take about 30 seconds to run. I know it does seem like it's doing something. All right, let's try again. Okay, now it's running. Okay, um, so yeah, like you can, like I said, you've got different steps here. So step one, just the image. Uh, step two is the label. You don't have to do that, but that's just good practice. Then we're copying in the configuration, then the application, um, and then essentially, yeah, then the application, and then again, we're running the configure.sh script, which essentially is um, basically, like I said, updating all the packages, etc. OK, so we'll leave that to carry on. Um, this, yeah, like I mentioned, this is just going to tag um, our Kubernetes YAML file with the repository we've created earlier. Um, and it'll do, uh, basically, yeah, we'll tag our images first, then we'll tag, um, change all the uh, code in our YAML file. Just give this a moment. And then essentially what we're going to finally do is we're going to, um, all right, let's see, make sure that's in the right place. Then we're going to go and deploy this to Kubernetes. Um, and again, it's going to deploy from our registry. Oh, okay, so that's all done. Um, so now as you just do tag, and then it will push these up to the IBM container registry. So again, we need an external place to pull from when we're using Kubernetes because this Kubernetes isn't running locally, it's running on a server somewhere else. So that's done and that's pushed up. So now I'll push the second one up. Shouldn't take long. And then this will basically replace in here the image names with um, it'll add the registry information in. So we paste that in. As you can see here, all the image names have changed in our YAML file. Awesome. And now I'm going to apply this YAML file. Okay, I am keeping an eye on the times. Ah, so it looks like I might have had all, something already running. So our applications are running. They've been running for seven hours, but imagine they've just deployed now. Um, so these are applications running. So as you can see, we have two systems here and one inventory microservice. So the point I want to kind of get across to you now. Um, so first thing we need to do, we need to proxy in. So open a new terminal, do kubectl proxy, and it'll start a proxy. And now if I open another terminal, um, I should be able to access um, that proxy. So I'm just going to add this in. OK, we should be ready to go. So now if I echo this out, we should have proxies for both our applications, which means we now should be able to get to them. So if I hit this curl command here, um, I should get the JVM properties back. And this is coming from one of our system microservices, which we have deployed. Awesome. Um, and if I run this on the inventory one, I should get a list of the certain the ones we have. So basically, it's just repeating the um, JVM properties which we've got from the system. Now, this is when it gets interesting. So if I run this command, this curl command, what this will do, it will hit an endpoint and tell that microservice to be unhealthy. So if I go back to here, you'll notice in a moment, our checks will run and one of these will then become unhealthy. Now, if I run this again, in the essence of the time, I'm going to run it three times just to make sure it's dead. <laughs> um, if I go back here, I should notice in a moment another microservice, so another system microservice go unhealthy. Now, what's happening is the inventory microservice, which relies on the system microservices, is now going to have a problem because it's not going to work because our system microservices are down. As you can see with the health checks we've implemented here, now the inventory service has become not ready because without the system microservice, um, it has no, it basically can't do anything. There's no JVM properties to retrieve. So while the system service is inactive or not ready, the inventory service as a consequence will probe the system microservice. And if it can't access it, it will then turn itself, um, basically deliver telemetry data back to Kubernetes, which will say, okay, this isn't healthy, stop delivering traffic here. Now, I think the call that, I think the wait period was at a minute. So you can see one system has come back up. Um, we should notice the other system come back up within a few seconds. And once both of those system microservices have come back up, um, the inventory one will go start probing, probing it again at the endpoints. And when it gets um, the get request it wants back, it will then turn itself back into a ready state. Now, in, there you go. 
Now, in the world of where everything has to be on all the time uh, and we expect our applications to be running all the time and we have the technology to make sure our applications are running all the time and they don't have downtime, these are really, really useful things to use and think about. And they're things you should be thinking about when you first start creating your application. Um, again, it's very useful because these kind of um, technologies and these APIs really do help you minimize downtime. Because in, like I said, in today's world, um, if something's down for an hour or a day, people might stop using it and we can't, we can't afford that anymore. Um, and now we have the technologies to help us um, get through this. So that's really all I wanted to show. There are There is more to um, this guide. I mean, it does go through how to test on this kind of infrastructure in this way as well. Um, and again, you can follow this along. A lot of our guides have this um, online capability so you don't have to install prereqs that you might not lose use at a later date. So feel free to check any of them out. And if you do have any more questions about any of these technologies and these factors, um, do reach out to Grace and myself and we'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And with that, Grace, I think I'm going to hand it back to you. Yeah, so I'll just do a quick summary and then we'll go on to your questions. So hopefully what we've shown you is in summary, although the 12 factor application methodology was a fantastic start, there are benefits of taking a look beyond that and looking at the 15 factor app methodology and how that can enable us to make applications that really thrive in the cloud. And like Jamie says, meet the expectations of modern society where we have applications that are secure, that are able to run all the time, that are healthy, that are responding very quickly and rapidly. So to really thrive in the cloud, we need to be looking at these 15 factors. And unfortunately, there are no excuses. There are tons of open source tools and technologies that are available to help. And as an action that we'd like you to take from this presentation, please think about your own applications and maybe start to evaluate how your application maybe uh, enables or maybe it doesn't enable some of these 15 factors. Are there any that you could take on board and say, actually, we can improve our application uh, by taking a look further at this particular factor? enabling it to thrive more within that cloud native environment. To help you with that, as I said, we've got some resources. So if you want to um, take a look at some of the guides that Jamie mentioned that are specific to a particular factor, if you head to the first and second links, the first is a, that original 12 factor mic, uh, application methodology. And in that we go through each of those original 12 factors and I've listed out particular guides that would be of interest to you. Uh, ranging from technologies from Jakar TE specific APIs to MicroProfile APIs and even additional APIs like um, we use MicroShare testing at one point, so test containers. Uh, the second one is those additional three factors that we focused on today, just looking at how we've gone beyond that 12 factor application and we're now looking at the 15 factors. So if you're interested in any of those new three factors and the technologies that you can use for them, head to that second link or that third link even, um, and that's where you can find out more about those additional factors if you're interested in taking a look at those guides. So thanks very much for listening. Hopefully we've shown you today some of those things you should be thinking about when designing your applications for the cloud and how you can go about doing that using open source technologies and tools. We'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Grace and Jamie, for your presentation. Uh, lots of uh, things I learned uh, personally and a uh, really nice introduction of um, Open Liberty. Uh, that uh, framework looks really useful. And uh, I hope that uh, many of uh, our attendees are already trying to, to deploy something or uh, at least to read the documentation. And let's go back to the question I already announced. So we had 12 factors, now there are 15. What do you think, folks? Um, maybe there are some good candidates uh, to be factor number 16, 17, and, uh, and so on. So what else could we miss in this uh, beautiful list of factors for the cloud native applications? So let, let's just dream big. <laughs> so, so as great uh, as Grace wrote the free articles that she linked here, I'm going to let Grace answer this one. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I, I, to be honest, it's one that I've had in the back of my mind, and I mentioned it throughout this presentation. It's sort of assumed in those 12 and 15 factors, but it's never specified. And that's to have this agile culture. So having an agile organization and agile processes. As I mentioned, these factors don't have to be about specific technologies. It's also about methodologies, processes, how you organize your organization. 
And without an organization that's ready to deliver something in an agile way, you're never going to be able to deliver your application and, and be able to respond to rapid events that are going on or technology changes. So for me, I would add agile organization slash agile processes as the 16th factor. But I'd say there's loads that you could add in. I mean, we're always going to be iterating on this. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. So uh, factor number 16 is get ready for more factors. Let's be agile. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty yes. much. <laughs> um, and um, I, will, I will use the opportunity to uh, ask a question from uh, myself. Uh, it's about uh, open liberty. So that's a really interesting framework. And how about deployment of uh, what we've created there to other cloud? Is that possible? Do you have for documentation? Do you have some guides about this? Funny you mentioned that, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> so I've literally uh, recently done a, a video series of deploying Open Liberty to um, AWS, Azure, um, the IBM Cloud, and basically OpenShift as well. So wherever you want to put OpenShift. Um, and basically just talking about the problems you, not so much open liberty, open liberty can just run anywhere. Um, if, if it, there's a, if take a containerized environment, open liberty can run there. Um, and you can get it to start up in one second, in two seconds, that's full blown Java and Jakarta EE, which is quite good. Um, but yeah, I do have, um, uh, if you go to IBM developer, there is an article there, which has links to those videos. But if you check out on YouTube and just put open liberty on AWS or open liberty on Azure, um, I do have videos that talk about that and my kind of reflections on what the different clouds are like and how they compare to each other. So um, yeah, do check that out. Um, and as you work for Microsoft, yeah, you can promote the uh, Azure video. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yes, uh, so please um, post the links you, you want to share with um, all our participants in our internal chat, and I will ask our mm -hmm. team to post it to general discussion thread. Uh, awesome, That's let's good. move on. And uh, we have um, a bit of... Um, Hollywood question, uh, Maven versus Gradle. What's uh, your opinion on, <laughs> on that and um, what will succeed after all? I mean, I've been using Maven for quite a while and Maven is still the de facto standard. And I, in my opinion, um, I don't think people, every, the, I don't think everyone will move to Gradle because there's a, an extra learning curve there. And I think everyone's quite apprehensive about the next technology that's going to come out. And I think people don't want to move to another technology when I'm pretty sure something else will come out in a few years. <laughs> and I think it kind of goes with the whole methodology of if Maven does everything you need, there's no point moving to something else. Now, Gradle has some extra functionality. I know you can write scripts in the configuration and do extra things like that. So if you require that, great. But if you don't, I don't see the point of moving to a different technology. And I honestly think Maven will probably be the standard. I mean, even when you use Gradle, it's pulling from a Maven repository. So yeah, I don't see Maven going anywhere, but it, that's my opinion. Yeah, yeah I would enough, agree. I uh, prefer Maven. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. just yeah. from personal preference. <laughs> the great thing is though, that if you do use Gradle, you can still use that with Open Liberty. Like there's the option for both. It's just Jamie and I tend to show Maven in our demos because we both prefer Maven. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, fair enough. And a very uh, pragmatic point of view. Uh, and I'm myself from a uh, world of uh, web front-end development and it's even mm -hmm. worse there. So we literally have a framework <laughs> of, the, of the week and uh, yeah, these new technologies, yep. they, they come <laughs> and, and, and go. Uh, and let's take the last question. Uh, Ruslan is asking, do we need uh, to override health check implementation in production? Uh, and uh, uh, what about default implementation? I believe it's based on your, your demo. So what, uh, what's your take on this? Yeah, so um, you can use the default, <laughs> default implementation, but you won't be able to, you need to really specify certain things. So it's okay. It's one thing to hit a microservice and it return OK, but that doesn't mean it's working. So you really do have to put in your code what you expect to be returned and make sure it hits the right endpoints. Because I can just hit localhost um, and the port number and the, the microservice might return it's OK, but the actual application might not have started. So it you have to use more than the default. I mean, as a minimum, you should use the default, but you should use more because it gives you more control over your application um, because things will happen outside of what the default is. Um, not every application uses the same port. Uh, yeah, so it, it has benefits because essentially it, it allows you to be, make sure your applications are more robust and you can actually 
probe certain things and set certain things rather than just allowing Kubernetes to handle it. Because of course, Kubernetes isn't designed for Java applications or this, that, and the other. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. It's designed for every type of application. So you really do have to go a bit more uh, fine grains and a bit lower level to kind of make sure Kubernetes is doing what it should. That, that's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Grace, Jamie, thank you very much for your technical session, for uh, open, friendly discussion, and uh, been a pleasure. Let's stay connected. Yeah, Brilliant. that's been great. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you. Enjoy the conference, everybody. Bye.